So welcome to the Restore Podcast. Welcome, Esther, to the Restore Podcast. How are you? I'm all right. It's so lovely to see you. It really is. So it's been a long old time. Uh, and I'm just really excited to be doing this. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it has been a while. It has been a while. Um, so this is really just, um, as I was saying to you just previously, this is just really a podcast for um, restorative conversations with real people. So it's a bit weird. This is the first time I've done a social distancing podcast. Um <laughs> Uh, in the current climate. So why are we doing it this way? Well, Esther, before we, we, before we talk about why we're doing it this way, because it is going to be the podcast forum of the future, um, let's tell, tell us a bit about you and about, a little bit about your background. Okay, so, uh, so I'm a health psychologist. So what that means is, so my area of interest in my training is about how people look after their physical health and what they do when they get ill. So kind of pertinent to now. Um, so what, what I'd done a lot of when I was training was working with people who had coronary heart disease because they have to make a lot of changes all at once. And it's really hard to make loads and loads of changes all at once. We're much better doing them one at a time. So, so I support people in that, do a lot of psychoeducation. <coughs> excuse me. It's not that cough. It's a different cough. <coughs> um, and uh, yeah, I think one of the things that I do the most is explain to people a little bit about how the human mind works and why it makes it difficult for us to change our behaviour, even when we know in our rational mind that we need to do a thing. But then we seem to scupper ourselves and it's quite hard for people. I think people can't forgive themselves sometimes for, for that happening. Um, so I used to teach a lot of health psychology and then I went to work in a medical school and I now research um, moral injury in healthcare professionals like all different kinds so it's I'm very interested in what's the psychological effects of practicing medicine at all whether you're a paramedic or a doctor or a nurse or whoever you are um, because obviously it's a really really high stress and very high stakes occupation and we're not very good at supporting people who do that job actually um, yeah so that's basically me really i speak oh. at conferences quite a lot i do over such a lot of well-being uh, type interventions with people and um i what do i do i spend a lot of time talking to people about how they do their job and what it's like for them and what bothers them and what helps them what makes them feel better yeah brilliant 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 so the reason i think why we're doing um this this forum right now is because it's a, it's march 23rd and it's going crazy out there, Esther. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's COVID central um, on the news and and everywhere else. So certainly affected my world as a paramedic. Uh, it's probably affected your world quite a lot as an educator and researcher. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it seems like a little bit like Night of the Living Dead or or um, some kind of dystopian movie that yeah. has gone wrong. But um, yeah, it's crazy crazy how's it affecting you at the moment is it is it affecting you at the moment yeah well it's affecting me a lot personally because i have to stay at home now which uh it turns out that's one of those things that you think oh it's great yeah <laughs> work from home i'll be with my family um it's, it'll be lovely i have loads of time and actually i'm busier than i've ever been um i'm running a support line for nhs frontline staff so for a few you know you have to be careful with your energy really so I just do that for a couple of hours every single day so that people can just phone and let off steam to someone who isn't their friends and family and who isn't at work because uh, it's obviously a really scary time um, I'm reading as much as I can about how to support staff um, so I'll be making lots of little um, videos and doing all my well-being sessions over Skype and stuff like that so it's a different world for me but it's nice but it's it's way busy I would say yeah Imagine, Esther, I can imagine, can imagine. So, um, so I met you, gosh, it was about a year, year and a half ago. I'd heard about you for famous, not infamous, uh, <laughs> in, in really good way, um, uh, around this, the concept of moral injury and how it might translate to me as a paramedic and how it tra might translate to a lot of healthcare professionals, but actually not even just healthcare professionals, military personnel, um, yeah. anyone who's, who's suffered a traumatic, um, uh, a traumatic sort of... Um, uh, life events really um and, and, and how it, how how that translates so so just for listeners and viewers what what is moral injury and what how, like so what does it encapsulate well yeah so it's like it's quite a difficult kind of time it's it, we're, we're kind of in it actually right now because it's um 
so it's a, it's about either perpetrating or being witness to acts that contravene your moral code in a high stakes situation um, and especially failures in leadership so when leaders make bad decisions that put people in harm's way that's considered to be morally injurious and also seeing so it was originally a concept of that um came from talking to military veterans and and it wasn't just the fact that they had killed people or that they'd seen people killed it was the fact that they'd seen um civilian casualties um they'd seen infra infrastructure destroyed like schools and hospitals and things like that uh, and that the, the world had become a kind of wrong place you know so they you know it's like you go on in your life and you have an idea of what a world should be like and how that should all feel and then something happens that throws all that into question and like now you see so there we were going along and we're used to we're used to viruses yeah but we're also used to being able to get better for, you know the majority of people being okay and not everybody catching it and there being enough resources to look after everybody um and we're used to bacteria and we're used to treating them with antibiotics and what's happening when things are morally injurious is that the world ceases to be safe and it feels like a wrong thing and we're not supported so we don't feel safe that we're we don't feel that we're being looked after and, and it's really important that we can have conversations about that and say i'm scared and i don't feel right and i thought the world was one way and it turns out to be another way and i suppose lots of people would say well that's kind of just growing up and and, and it is sure fine but it's it's worth talking about so what i do with healthcare professionals is, is we talk about what makes it okay what makes it difficult what makes it unbearable sometimes and and by talking about it we can realize that a lot of people feel the same as one another which is, of course is one of the most useful things we can ever do for each other really absolutely absolutely and um i think you know it very much it is very much affected my life um it's affected a lot of my colleagues lives i think and it's something i'd actually like to touch on um a little bit more actually in this podcast. So um, this podcast, I'm going to name this podcast Acceptance and Sacrifice. Uh, it's a yeah. concept I came up with about half an hour ago, as you'd be pleased to call <laughs> Deep thinker. Nice um, fresh. <laughs> 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 um, but what I'd like to explore, and I have wanted to explore with you for a while, is a couple of concepts really, because I think I think um, one which, which, which the moral injury really touches on is the sacrifice element. But another element really is about acceptance. And... I know that you, a lot of a lot of your research and or teaching and courses you've taken in the past have been around acceptance. So, yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, or, or group acceptance and how we not only accept how we communicate necessarily, but how we can cleave advantage from that and, and make it better. Um, so just just looking at acceptance for 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 for. Uh, a moment, Esther. Just looking at sort of the, the the traditional sort of cognitive therapy approach versus what maybe more of a, a, an embracing open approach to thoughts yeah. and feelings. Yeah. Um, what what does what does what does an accepting or because I know you took the the um, the the course. What is it now? Let's have a look. The uh, the oh. acceptance and commitment therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what, what's the premise of, of acceptance and commitment therapy? What is the premise of that course? So acceptance and commitment therapy still kind of counts as one of the cognitive behavioral type therapies, okay? Because it is about thinking about your thoughts and how they affect your behavior and, and what your feelings are kind of like. Um, but what's different about it is it's based on, well, I guess it doesn't really matter what the, the theoretical basis is, particularly now for the purposes of this podcast, but rather than, so where in CBT you might find that somebody's saying, okay, well, you need to look at your thought and say, well, is that rational or not rational? You know, is that you can catastrophizing? Are you <clears throat> using black or white thinking? Are you, uh, you, know, you know, is this a kind of reasonable thought? And so the idea is to, to find evidence for it not being a reasonable thought, and then it isn't a hindrance to you anymore. So that's really basic broad strokes any cbt practitioners listening to this will be rolling their eyes at me but the, the point i'm trying to make i guess is acceptance and commitment therapy is much more like a kind of secular buddhist approach of saying listen life is pain stuff is really hard and no amount of thinking about it is going to make it any less hard so you have a choice so you can either get stuck in what's difficult and not move forward or you can go this is really hard and i hate it and it hurts and I'm going to go forward. So it uses a lot of metaphors to help us understand 
the ways in which we get in our own way. So humans are really good at getting in their own way about things because we overthink it and we worry about what other people think about us. And um, what the so the classic, I guess I don't have one here. I wish I had one. So so the classic um, metaphor that they use with you when you first kind of start. Do you know what a, a, a finger trap is? It's like a kind of toy. It's a woven toy and you put your finger in it oh, but when yeah. you pull your finger you can't take your finger out yeah, yeah in yeah, order yeah. to get your finger out you have to lean in so what they're saying is you gotta lean into what you feel in order to progress through it because avoiding it the problem with avoiding our feelings and avoiding what is difficult is that takes loads and loads of energy and it means that you can't have certain experiences mm. because if you're avoiding so one example might be sort of social situations well if you avoid them all then you can't get any of the good out them out of them because you've avoided the com them completely just in order to not feel the bad. Yeah. Would it not be a bit easier or more effective to feel a bit of the bad and go, oh, that's not very nice, is it? And then you can still get the good. Mm. And the other point about acceptance and commitment therapy is that we're putting people in touch with their values. So what you want to do with people or yourself, you can do it yourself, there's loads mm. of books and, and websites, is to say, now, what am I even trying to do here? What do I want? What do I need? Where am I trying to get to? All that kind of stuff. So if you can identify that, then it's much easier to go through the difficult. It's just like, if you want to be better at running, you're going to have to run. That's going to mean you're going to have to get sweaty and out of breath and have sore feet. And, you know, if you get really keen, your toenails fall out. But the point is, that's okay because that's what we said we'd do in order to get where we're going. Do you yeah. see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's an actual. It's actually a bridge to health and a bridge to. Sounds like it's a. It's, it's actually a bridge to healing uh, and to and and to acceptance is interacting and engaging with the painful process. Interacting, and yeah. Maybe with the with the event if it was an event. Um, if, it, if, it, if it was, you know, maybe a, a traumatic event to yourself or to other people, but but that engagement yeah. um, and, and not not carpet up, sweep under, and, and yeah, and, well, you, because you can't in the end. Yeah. You run out of energy, or you run out of carpet. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> There's so much <laughs> under the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah. absolutely absolutely so just looking at that a little bit a little bit more because i think this is fascinating and um i actually think it's a real that you know there's 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 real linkages here to 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 health and healing from from some quite traumatic traumatic events um so looking at cognitive diffusion what i'm just going to put the light on it because I'm, I'm 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 actually I know, I was getting getting darker and darker plunged into darkness we that's are. better that's better <laughs> better um okay so yeah what what is cognitive diffusion and because it, oh, sounds, it sounds really sexy but um <laughs> but um i haven't got a clue what it is <laughs> yes yeah, so so a lot of these concepts whenever you say them i really remember myself like on a training course there was a great guy called um, martin wilkes and i think the other man was called harry i did it at the mindfulness center i think it is in london uh i'll have to send you the details but um so cognitive diffusion is one of the things that I had really struggled to understand. So the point is, when we are so fused, like I'll use my hands because it makes it easier. So we're so fused with our thoughts that we can't kind of see past them. We can't do anything else. So one of the ways to get people to understand how to diffuse from their thoughts is to imagine. So we'll, ju we'll just do it. So imagine the sky right so today is a great day because it's a beautiful blue sky so you want to imagine the sky right and sometimes there are clouds and sometimes there's rain and there's even stars and there's a sun and a moon and maybe a rainbow or lightning so all these things happen against the backdrop of the sky but the sky is always the same and the sky is you and all the weather is your thoughts and all the events and all the things, but they don't change the sky. They happen in the sky, but, no, but the sky is always the same, right? So the you of you is always the same. So if you can remember that there's you and all the things that happen are like another layer on top of you, um, it, it takes away some of that, you know how, when something's gone wrong or we feel ashamed or embarrassed or humiliated or abandoned or any of these awful feelings 
things and you feel like it's really common to have that feeling like I'm never going to be okay ever again right but you're going to be fine because the sky you are always the same and you're always all right Mm -hmm. so if we can see the clouds of the rainbow whatever you want to say and let them move on in their own time that's how we're going to be okay but if we try to hold on and and sort of hold this terrible feeling and say that's me now that's that's who i am it's not who you are yeah it never was it's almost like it's almost i I 100 percent agree with you esther it's almost like being an observer of weather rather than the weather and and it's sitting sitting on the side of a busy busy road where all these cars are thoughts but just observing it rather than being in the middle of it you know you you are you almost you are an observer of it rather than identifying with yeah with it which is powerful actually because it's a powerful tool of like you say diffusing uh, or distancing or disconnecting yourself from from the emotion from the from the from the from the, from from the roller coaster really of of those yeah. those thoughts yeah that's powerful yeah that's powerful yeah yeah there's i really really like it there's another analogy if this is easier for people because i mean we you all have to find the one that works for you yeah. um about being a house imagine you're the house and all your thoughts or the events of your life all of these things are the furniture in the house now you can put your furniture wherever you like can't you you can move it around you can put it all in the kitchen it doesn't matter what you do with it it doesn't change the integrity of the house okay so your integrity the unit of you is is always there and that can be such a because what we want to do really is it's like calm down you know and these thoughts so when we diffuse from our worry and our panic and our humiliation or whatever it is then we get that lovely feeling of calm Mm -hmm. and that's the feeling that reminds you that you can definitely bear this thing you've Mm -hmm. just got to bear it just keep breathing that's all Gosh, and that really relates to uh, Esther to where we are now, because yeah. there's a lot of worry in the environment. There's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of hysteria, a lot of panic, and some of it quite rightly so. Some of it um, yeah. quite misplaced and maligned, but yeah. it, it's a great lens to view this through, because actually yeah. what that does is maybe shift you to a p- place where we will f- move through this. This will. As another colleague of mine said, there's never been a double night. Night, the night only occurs once, and then the day occurs. But it's it, it, we will move through this, um, yeah. um, and you've just got to stick with it. Not identify or be identified by it, but but, yeah. but allow it to allow it to pass um, with a good, healthy dose of self care, and, yeah. and and looking after yourself. But that's that's really powerful, and I think really on topic for for for, for right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Esther, looking just a little bit at um, just we, we're just going to touch on it once more, then we're going to move on just around this fear acronym. Um, there's a summary of sort of what causes problems. Remember it now. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. I've got it here. I've got it here. But I think you, hopefully you can expand on it. But just fear. So so fear. It's F would be fusion with your thoughts. E would yeah. be the evaluation of experience. A would be the avoidance of your experience, and R would be the reason giving for your behaviour. But so just looking at the fusion with your thoughts now that just just uh, so so don't worry I'll 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 take this one uh, or not um but it's I think it's I think it's quite just what you were you were saying actually Esther which is actually you know identifying with your thoughts but not letting not letting them define you and not yeah. not, not letting them um define not only you as a person but your mood and actually, I think that's massive because it, you, if you can transcend the waves of emotion and, and thought life um, and see them for what they are, you can then become quite a transcendent being throughout your day-to-day life. And, and then actually, you do start to become far more bulletproof, whereas you, know, the tra- you, know, tr- you can start to transcend some pretty crazy emotions and some pretty yeah. crazy thoughts and not let yeah. them affect you. One of the ma- biggest things I've learned as a paramedic, Esther, is letting fairly go and not letting fairly yeah. because I, I unfortunately have to confront it on a daily basis with some really difficult patients and some really actually some patients that are gonna that die in front of me that I could never yeah. that I could never save I, I could no. never save anyway no. I was yeah. they were never going to be they no. were never going to come back they were always going to die and actually mm-hmm. having that conversation with family that death that, that death conversation with family and feeling you know just 
heart wrenched for them and for the situation for the mm -hmm. patient, but actually being able to let that go at the end of the day, and that yeah. fusion of it, it, it's 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 okay. What you did is enough. Who you are is yeah. enough, um, and not being defined by that, which I think you kind of move through as an early practitioner and as an er early mm -hmm. early clinician. To and then you move through to a place of actual acceptance in yeah. what 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 you are and who you are is is enough. Um, and that's quite yeah. releasing. I find that quite releasing, actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so the evaluation of experience um, from your perspective, when people evaluate perspective experience, um, and this probably feeds into moral injury, actually, how would you counsel people to evaluate quite traumatic experience or well well the way yeah so so we always evaluate our experiences through the frame of everything that's already happened to us and what we've been told growing up and you know who we believe ourselves to be and all our frame of reference which is really often our family or the people in, in whose company we grew up and our friends and, and and perhaps our professional colleagues and sometimes it's a little bit hard to hold on so the example of, of being present when somebody dies is a really good one because say you've got um so not getting technical i'm trying really hard not to get technical so, um, so you've got an out, out of hospital cardiac arrest so somebody's had a cardiac arrest perhaps at home and um they for whatever reason so there's lots of reasons why they're not necessarily going to come back so that's they're dead okay so they died really in that moment and letting yourself you know evaluating your your experience to say okay i'm sad but i'm not kind of broken because actually perhaps they were old perhaps they were frail perhaps they weren't you know but people do die that is part of life and being letting that go like the weather passing across the sky is really important you don't have to hold on to it to make it count so sometimes it feels a bit like if you don't keep someone in mind or keep an experience in mind it's as if it didn't matter this is a really big thing in when we're grieving for someone our feelings change through grief and we start to sort of move on and feel a bit better and then we feel guilty for feeling a bit better but it doesn't mean you forgot them and it doesn't mean they didn't count it just means that you can't feel like that all the time there isn't energy for it it's not a great way to use your energy so so the evaluation the experience like allowing that yeah that was not great or maybe it was okay actually yeah. and that you can move on from it a lot of doctors will tell me so i you know before i started when i started i guess i had a really fixed idea of like what was a traumatic event and what hurt people and all this and then sitting and talking to doctors and paramedics they've said actually if i've done everything that i could have done and i've done it right i've done my best i'm all, i'm okay I'm okay, regardless of the outcome for the patient. So actually someone dying isn't the worst thing. It's much more, you know, other things. And even then, mm. if you don't forgive yourself, you can't move on, which is what we're going to come on to in just a tick when we do avoidance. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so yeah, so it is avoidance of your experience. So that would be the A, so avoiding your experience. And I'll, I'll let you speak on this really because um, you've done quite a lot of work on it, but I can certainly see and testify from, from some of the people around me actually that avoid their experiences. It's not a good thing. No, it isn't, but it's really human. So just for everybody who's listening, because <laughs> I was really mindful that when we hear things like this, it's as if you and I are giving a sort of like an ideal way of doing things. But what, what people need to know is that these are really human things. OK, so it, we, we have to make an effort to not do them. So our default is a lot of this worry and avoiding our experience and all that kind of stuff. And then we need to make conscious effort to not do them. So with the experiential avoidance, so we don't like bad feelings because they feel bad. <laughs> so yeah. obviously we're going to try not to feel them obviously and we have loads we're really <coughs> we're really expert we have loads of ways to not feel our feelings we can <coughs> we can turn them from feelings into into like intellectual thoughts instead we can use substances like alcohol or food or drugs or whatever you like to not feel them we can run around being really 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 busy so that we don't have to feel them there are loads of ways we can sleep a lot all the time another way to not feel them there's loads of ways to push away our feelings the, the issue that arises there is if you can't feel it i'm afraid it is very much like a block drain i'm sorry that's a terrible analogy but it's like a block drain you can't nothing's gonna move 
yeah. it's just gonna get more blocked and the problem with that is it's gross and it smells bad and nothing works anymore and what we need to be doing is letting it move through let ourselves feel it because it will pass you know the fear of the feeling is is often worse than the feeling it's like you know when people cry so a lot of people don't like it when other people cry and they sort of think oh my god you know someone's going to start crying and they're just never going to stop it's not true they don't never stop you know it's like your mate was saying that you don't get two consecutive nights it's there's always a day in between there's always a break feelings come up they're like waves on a beach they come and go and the other problem with avoidance is that it really takes a lot of energy and maybe like I don't know the older you get or the more stuff you've got going on in your life the less energy you have for avoiding your feelings yeah. so stop it because it let the weather happen yeah so yeah. it's really easy for me to say that because it really took me a lot of practice to do it um, and I'm a, I'm a great one for intellectualizing and not feeling my feelings in, in my body or in my kind of heart or my soul or whatever you want to call it. And uh, especially in this, like in the current situation. So I'll give you an example. Um, I woke up uh, on Saturday morning and I started to cry as soon as I woke up and I just didn't stop. Mm. Like it was extraordinary. And, you know, I said it, people always stop crying. Of course, I stopped crying in the end, but it really shook me and I was a bit like, dude, I don't even know why I'm crying. I don't feel sad. And so this crying is happening, right? So I'm kind of doing my day and doing some crying and explaining to my family that, okay, today I'm going to be crying apparently. <laughs> and I got a message from someone uh, who wanted, he said a lot of things in the message. And one of the things he said was, I don't think I've ever told you how incredible I think you are. And then I was gone gone that's what I was crying about I was crying about I was really sad because I'm frightened of losing people now in this time I was doing some anticipatory grieving that's and I needed to just do that in order to feel better and of course you know by the late afternoon it was all done I felt much better so I could have just tried not to feel any of that I could have pushed it all away. I could have told myself, everything's all right, everything's all right, everything's all right. Actually, on that day, it was not all right. Um, so it's, it can be really disruptive. It's quite disruptive to sit there and cry for hours. Yeah. And I'm still here. The weather yeah. passed. Yeah, the weather passed. The sky is... <laughs> you know, the weather passed, passed. absolutely. But, 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 but you, like you said, choosing to engage, Esther, with that, you know, and choosing to engage with it, but, but, but know the finite nature of that. So it will be, yeah. it, it, it's here for now. Um, I, I, I'm willing to engage with it whilst it's here, but, but, but and not avoid it. Yeah, not avoid the emotion, not avoid, and hopefully get to the root of it. So we'll get to the root of why. Yeah, you're yeah, maybe, yeah. And um, so I had a very similar circumstance, actually. So my, well, well similar in the fact it involved, involved me doing a lot of crying. Um, I lost my sister-in-law, Gosh, it was, she was 27 at the time. This is probably about oh, 10, 10 years ago. Yeah, 10 years ago. And at the time, 10 years ago, I very much sort of flipped into work mode. I was still a paramedic at the time. Yeah. And, you know, I was there for my family, was there for my brothers, uh, was there for my, <clears throat> my mom and dad and, and her mom and dad, and very much played the facilitator role. The, yeah. You know, Owen's got it together. He deals with this all the time role, but never really truly engaging, uh, certainly avoiding. Okay. The, the, the pain that it was causing me because because of, of, of perceptions really what, what I wanted to project and uh, and how yeah. people, I wanted people to perceive me it caught it so caught up with me though Esther it yeah. so caught up with me and it came it came out at the most inappropriate time so I'll tell you when it came out so it was I, I was just at work one time and I was treating a chap that wasn't really that severely injured and um, but it's funny, you know, a cognitive anchor from 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 my sister-in-law Catherine uh, came up, and it was it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a song that was playing on that day, uh, was playing in the background, and I just I heard this song whilst ever I was treating, and it was from the day I realised I was told she she died, and I went up to support my brother, and I was treating this chap at the time who wasn't really that injured. Anyways, I I, 
I started, I couldn't, I could just feel this overwhelming tide coming up and I was like, oh, this is happening whether I like it or not. So, so anyways, I, I, I started to cry and then, and then I thought, I can't, I can't do this. But then I, 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 the more I started to try to suppress it, the more it came out. Yeah. And yeah. this guy must have thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. <laughs> the paramedic yeah. is bawling his eyes out. This is going to be, this is a bad day. And I had to, so I had to break away. I had to let it out. And then I had to come back to him and said, listen, this has got nothing to do with you. I'm so, so sorry. Uh, I'm going to get another colleague to deal with you because I'm just, I'm dealing with a lot right now. But it was a classic case of welling it down and just and, and not interacting or engaging yeah. with it. And, and it would come out and it came out and it was, but yeah. at the time, but the guy must have thought, oh, I'm <laughs> so dead right now. <laughs> the paramedic's crying. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but yeah, so just, you know, and, and, and it was a real lesson for me to be, to be like, actually, if you don't deal with it, it will deal with you mm -hmm. at some well, point. Yeah, it's true. At yeah. some juncture. So you've really got to, you know, be, just be, be really observant of, of, of feelings and, and, and don't. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So moving through that. So the last one of the fear acronym, I think we're going to pivot slightly towards uh, the sacrifice element in a sec. So the last, the last one is reason giving for your behavior. So, right. Yeah. So, so just, I think, so, so, so um, I'll let you take this one, but just uh, this prompts for me, just taglines or excuses or reasons that you might give yeah. for behavior, which, which might, which, which, which might excuse it temporarily, but actually doesn't deal with the root source. Yeah. I, I, well, I guess you see humans are funny ducks. We, we always want to give reasons for our behavior and for other people's behavior. And they're usually the ones that we give to other people's behavior are usually completely wrong. So just know that we're really bad at knowing why people have done what they've done. Yeah. Uh, that's why we need to use our words to tell each other why we've done what we've done. Um, I think sometimes the reason giving stuff is another way of avoiding the parts of ourselves that we just don't want to see. So like everybody's jealous, everybody's scared, everybody's mean you know and everybody's kind and everybody's generous and everybody's good and everybody's full of love these are all true right this is what makes a person yeah. and it's hard for us to accept that there are bits bits of ourselves so maybe even especially now when everybody i don't know they're so we're so seen aren't we like in social media we're so kind of public and maybe that makes it a little bit harder to say god sometimes i'm just awful Mm -hmm. don't know what to tell you sometimes I'm awful sometimes I get stuff wrong I forget stuff I turn you know I'm maybe hung over and short-tempered and especially now I think in this time like there's loads of psychological research to under to explain the behavior that people are doing right now so when they're maybe not observing social distance, distancing and stuff and also the difficulties of being in quarantine or isolation and how that makes us behave so there's loads and loads of research that ex explains it all in perfectly sort of benign ways, but we're not always very good at, um, I don't know, just allowing that part of ourselves that we don't want mm. at all. Yeah. Uh, so we just give loads of other like rationalizations. So, th but this is, it's just another way of avoiding the feelings. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. Absolutely. So Esther, just, just panning back a little bit and just looking at um, the other, other aspect of this podcast. So, so the acceptance is powerful, I think, and, and we've summarized that quite, quite nicely or touched on a few little elements quite nicely. And just looking at the, the whole sacrifice part of, 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 of things and how that may, might feed into a couple of things we were talking about before we started recording around around moral injury but also um around sort of the sacrifice of the day the, the longevity of sacrifice of yeah. in different terms really but maybe just tackling it from a from a moral injury point of view because um i think that those go beyond us and speak to something beyond us that we have to then pick up the pieces uh with afterwards um so so from a sacrifice point of view and just taking it from any which way you want to um what what would you say how would you say that feeds into some of the research you've been looking at so i think so when i started thinking about moral injury and so i was reading about these soldiers and i really you know i'm not a soldier i'm been in the forces i don't know very many people in the forces and i think i have like you have a load of preconceptions don't you about people and the jobs that they've chosen to do and how they've chosen to do them i think in a way sort of sacrifice or to use a word like duty or something like that these are really useful values that we can 
tap into i think they are kind of worth it they're worth engaging with and the problem i suppose with the with what had happened with regard to moral injury was that people felt like they had made the sacrifice right so they said yes i'll be a soldier which is a really hard job and also so the same in medicine um i'll do this really hard job and i will bear a lot of like the pain for everybody else mm. if you see what i mean because that is what essentially what they're doing and it's not to say that people don't want to do it because they want to do it and good for them that's fine but there is also a sense in which for society like we get people to bear our pain for us um and the problem was that they were then so badly let down so we always so in the workplace and in our relationships with other people we always have what we call psychological contracts and that that's what we believe about what this situation is all about and what it's for and what we will do for one another so the problem with the soldiers in the moral injury situation was that their leaders had let them down so they didn't have adequate kit um they were not adequately fed they weren't properly trained they were alone very often so they weren't uh, rotated in and out on units which usually they would have been they came in and out as individuals which is a terrible idea don't do that mm. um, and it's it's interesting in healthcare so for a long long time and, and like this is known now but when i started talking about this stuff we didn't really talk about the fact that really if i'm really honest though and we had totally thrown all our healthcare professionals under the bus for yeah. so long yeah. and it is true and there is no other way to put it and i really stand by that and we had expected them to bear you know witnessing death witnessing pain being unable to fix stuff you know being trained to fix a thing and then unable to fix it all these kinds of things all these really difficult feeling and like they bear it for us yeah because for the lay people we're not doing it and they are and now it's thrown into such stark relief because it's literally in the papers all the time that we have asked them to go above and beyond for us mm. and that's fine if then society can meet its obligations to them so i think sacrifice is great and duty and honor and all those things they're brilliant they're really useful values and we can get a lot of personal growth out of them and it's a two-way street so the damage comes when the other half doesn't doesn't make their obligation do you, do you see what i mean yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and it, it almost usurps their you know their sense of because i think everyone's got an individual filter or perception of how what what, what sacrifice for, for in the line of duty might 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 take but when yeah. it usurps that and and exceeds that greatly so um then uh, there's almost no social or psychological context or box yeah. just box they can yeah. put in yeah. Yeah. And, and 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 accept what happened and and accept themselves oh gosh i guess um yeah. in, in certain terms um which is yeah yeah really hard really hard yeah. um you know having to i had it i have a so just to put that into real term context uh esther i have a friend of mine and now quite a well-known public figure actually who you know, had to go, it was part of the special forces and had to go abroad and, you know, and enact missions and use weapons uh, in areas and on people that he, that actually he did not, wasn't necessarily ready for, you know, because yeah. they, they, if, 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 if he would have let them live, um, they may have informed. They would inform inform certain parties, which would have then meant that the, yeah. whole, the whole mission and their their safety would have been compromised. But 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 being specific, having to having to potentially shoot at vulnerable people groups is not within the brief of what you sign up for, and no. then coming to terms with that at a later date is very difficult um yeah. you know very difficult and you know e e even from a personal perspective you know having having to treat you know dead kids under buses i've had to pull kids a six-year-old out of the wheel arch of a car i've had to treat uh, um, murder cases with a six-month-old that's gone that went to the old bailey um yeah, all these horrendous horrendous cases um, yeah. and, and you think you know the, 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 some of the innocence of 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 of, of, the, of the of the children, but it's just it, it, so it's around coming to terms. I think, like you said, with the fact that there's 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 a sacrifice in the line of duty, which 
we didn't necessarily sign up for, but actually yeah. still have to deal with and, and engage with. Um, and you can't prepare for, I don't think. I think no. that's the problem yeah. a lot of the time. You can't prepare for it. And it's frightening. It's really frightening if you know it's coming because it, if you start a job as a paramedic or whatever, you know you're going to see things. It's part of the deal kind of thing, but it's not, you kind of can't prepare for it. You've just yeah. got to be ready to do it when it comes. But, but it's a hard thing. Yeah, and, and it's like what people are doing now it feels like a funny parallel to draw but trying to self-isolate or to maintain your distance from other people so not do was very hard actually there's an awful lot of uncertainty and essentially we're being asked to kind of keep still you know like you know shelter in place wait at home don't go out and that's really hard because what we really want to do is get control of this situation and the only way and it's it's really not what we're used to in an individualistic society. The only way to get control of the situation is actually to kind of do as we're told and stay at home and kind of be still. That's it. You're doing it. If you're sitting on your sofa, you're doing it. You're winning. You're doing exactly what needs to be done. But that's really hard. And we don't. That's not what we think. Action and heroism and goodness and all that. We don't think it's that. We think. Yeah, yeah I absolutely agree. I, and I think like we are fundamentally. Um, quite locomotive beings we like to move we like yeah. to move we like to you know we're here yeah. we're there we're everywhere even when i'm teaching i'm here there and everywhere yeah. um i've just you can tell i've had a, a pint of coffee um starting to get <laughs> um but you but we are yeah but we right staying still is actually really and just interesting something you said earlier you know just the micro sacrifices of in the data the, the, the micro sacrifices that we're being asked to make of of, yep. like, of staying still when we are so fundamentally uh, locomotive people moving here there and yeah. there. it's actually really difficult to yep. s sacrifice you know exercise or indeed you know we are community seeking yeah. as well so we're sacrificing an element of community we're sacrificing an element of locomotion and and to to a lot of us some people it comes quite natural to be on a couch that's fine sure people, yeah yeah or to be alone yeah. some people really love to be by themselves i don't really like to be by myself but there, there are things i miss and i think so because like i'm under really quite a lot of restriction i'm really not supposed to go out of the house at all um and that's not easy and i have shed a lot of tears over that like a big old baby um <laughs> so the other thing of course is that so let's assume that we're safe where we are so i know that lots of people are not safe you know people are, are stuck in difficult relationships difficult situations maybe not good housing that kind of thing so so let's set that aside for just a tick and just imagine that we're safe and we have everything we need and we have you know netflix and prime and you know enough beer in the fridge and pizza whatever it might be but the other thing that's going to happen, you know, because we talked about it earlier, the other thing that's going to happen when we're doing this being still is that we can't avoid a lot of stuff now. So a lot of our experiential avoidance, it takes the form of going to work or going to the pub, going shopping. Shopping is a really, really big one. Going to the gym, a lot of that. So a lot of that is stripped away. So we're kind of left alone with ourselves in a way that we wouldn't normally be. And that's going to be really challenging for people because it's all coming that's yeah. you know yeah the confronting the, the, the confronting self is upon us yeah in a way that, that you, you yeah. have, people have got to engage with a less busy version of yourself which is quite exposing yeah. um i think yeah 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 Cool. Listen, to, just to come into land slightly on sacrifice and just to take a little bit of a pivot and a turn um in the conversation around just the sacrifice I've seen and had to, and, and me and you have both had to do this, I think, and, and I think a lot of people have had to do this, is, is the sacrifice of sort of today for tomorrow. So, so a very different type of sacrifice, but, you know, sacrificing, yeah. you know, the way we, in which we study for three years or five years or seven years, yeah, yeah. having to, you know, when I, when I was doing my MSc, I was like, I'm never doing this again. This is, you know, <laughs> life is hell. I hate, you know, I hate reading, I hate studying. But, um, but, but just the, the element of actually, I think it's a fundamental prerequisite of moving on in, uh, of moving through life and maturing in life is, is the element of sacrificing today for tomorrow. And those people that don't mm. sacrifice tomorrow for today, so everything the trappings of the day that everything that today brings in itself yeah. I, I think don't 
always necessarily understand the power of sacrificing the day. Yeah. Yeah. And I, well, I think, and it's a real acceptance and commitment therapy thing as well, because it's like, this, these are my values. This is what I've said. This is where I'm going. And so this is where I have to go, no matter if I'm bored or I'm tired or I don't want to study or I want to go out with my mates and actually I have essays to write or whatever it might be. And it's, it's just, an element of you know grit and toughing it out and 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 we talk about that though and I, I know how hard it can be to hear that kind of stuff if you're not really in that headspace so just for anyone who's listening or watching and they're not in their headspace of feeling really galvanized for their future at the moment so so like you don't have to do everything at once mm-hmm. there's something really human that just goes oh my god I have to do everything the same. but you can't it's been said forever you know the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step right so you know how do you eat an elephant one spoonful at a time just do the next thing okay do the little thing and practice actually do practice whatever it is doesn't matter what it is and you will get better at it you will build strength just like a muscle builds strength it's it's the same our willpower and our ability to sacrifice and to be present in the moment all of that practice like i am the first person to be rubbish at this stuff i get frustrated so easily you know i always when i do talks i always say like i can't do mindfulness because i'm too antsy so i have to do yoga um because i'm really busy concentrating on not falling over and then it makes me be present okay find your thing do your thing Mm -hmm. and I, th- we talk about rewards a lot. So in my profession, because we want people to change their behavior, so there's always a bit of an argument. You, you get people to reward themselves or not. And then there's a real sense of like, maybe don't do that. Maybe let the action be the reward because otherwise you build a funny sort of system that feeds back on itself in a not quite healthy way. It's not all Marks and Spencers, you know, like oh, you deserve the luxury chocolate thing it's not really a question of what you do or don't deserve. It's like, just do it, do the thing. You will feel better if you do the thing, but it's really fine to do the thing in small increments. You don't have to do all the thing at once. Yes, exactly. Okay. Well, I still a hundred percent. And I find exactly that. And actually don't wait for the perfect circumstances to do the thing. Oh my gosh. No, don't, no <laughs> it's crack on. the perfect music, the perfect Irish yeah. coffee, the perfect, yeah. the perfect, you know, you don't need to make, circumstances or the environment perfect it just needs to happen in like in, in, in sequential and in an incremental fashion and yeah. there's, there's real oh gosh there's how much that there is you know there's real acceptance in that and there's yeah. real there's, but there's real progress as well and I, I really love that actually just just those micro steps of of, yeah. of, yeah. of, of, of movement um yeah. is is absolutely absolutely um that's powerful esther that's powerful that is powerful listen you are a legend i realize the sun has already set and so we've, we've been <laughs> going for set. an hour um which has been great but listen you have been an absolute legend so if people want to find you or find your work esther how would they oh wow uh yeah you can find me on now i can't remember my twitter handle is i hope just look uh so it's uh i think it's underscore em health site let's no it's not absolute rubbish bear with call it hang on okay so <laughs> at em underscore health psych and uh you can google me and you'll there are some podcast well we did a podcast before didn't we so there's podcasts um various and um articles and things and a, a blog and uh bits and bobs of things kicking about really yeah. uh yeah. just type in esther murray like i did on the internet and you'll pop, pop up <laughs> yeah. and lots of the magical, cool stuff. yeah Pop up. Come and come and play on Twitter, where, where academics hang out, <laughs> and paramedics apparently. <laughs> and paramedics, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Esther, listen, you've been an absolute legend, and thanks so much for. Uh, no for... worries, it's lovely to talk to you. It's great to see you. All right, cheers. Thanks for that. <laughs>